Okay, good afternoon to our young engineers and non-engineers joining the call today. Welcome to CSA's Youth Best Practice webinar on engineering leadership and management. Today we have an exciting program installed for you to, um, and I'm glad that there's as many attendees as have joined. Um, and to those of us that have joined, please share the information um, that we do share with you today. I will be your host today. I am Sayuri Naiga, an electrical engineer at Vegan Group. I am also the chair of the CESA YPF Cowton North Branch, and I sit on various other committees in the CESA platform. So today we have an exciting program in store. We're going to be talking about what are the best practice for our young engineers out there. And of course, also for non-engineers, we have uh, an amazing uh, host speaker, Carly Harvinker, and I will let you know more about her uh, in a minute. And she's going to be taking us through her life journey and her career development part. I think there's a lot to be learned. So definitely as young engineers, we must make use of this opportunity to just really be sponges and absorb as much information that we can from our seasoned uh, engineers and our seasoned experts out there. Um, many of us are looking into diversing our career and maybe moving into starting our own consulting company or our own businesses one day. And I think um, there's so many lessons that Carly would have learned throughout her journey that we can uh, take with us. So if you have any questions and answers, uh, not really answers, if you have any questions or comments throughout um, the webinar, please do uh, participate with us. Pose those questions to Carly in the Q&A and when she's done with our presentation, we will um, take you through, uh, through answers that she will give to us. Also, there's a chat uh, function available. Um, maybe put your questions in the Q&A platform, but let's use the chat to really engage um, these platforms that uh, CESA hosts is a great opportunity to build your engineering network. So let's start by uh, going onto the chat, letting us know what discipline you are in, how many years of experience uh, you have, and what brings you here today. What, what are you looking to learn and take away from this event? Okay, um, let me, with no further ado, introduce you to our speaker. Carly Havinger. She's a transport engineer um, and she's a specialist in the field with more than 36 years of experience working in the industry, um, 26 of which she has worked as an independent transport consulting engineer. And her story will encourage you to look beyond the early difficulties that we face as engineers. Um, she, much like myself, started off as a shy graduate in a totally male dominant industry. And yet she has managed to secure a bright future for herself and for her family. Her company is quite successful and she's going to share that career path and her story with you and let you know about some of her challenges and how she overcame them. Um, before we started this webinar, I had a quick chat with Coralie and we basically was discussing um, how my company, Bacon Group, has worked with her previously. So I'm, even though I didn't have the privilege of working with her personally, her name is as really it really holds so much of uh, wealth and in the industry she is really a sought after transport engineer. So um, Carly will share that story for you. Your name is really what you hold as an engineer, and she's going to tell you how she's been able to build up her name into what it is today. At Begin Group, whenever we are looking for a transport engineer to assist us with our projects, we do many uh, multi uh, mixed use developments where of course traffic engineering plays an important part and is a factor that we need to consider. We go to Cordley for that. So that's the type of engineers that all of us needs to aim to be one day. We want, uh, there's some electrical work to be done somewhere. I would love uh, for everyone to be thinking, yeah, we must call Sairi for her expertise. So I think Carly will, will give us some insights on how she managed to do that and what she focused on early in her career that enables her to be as successful as she is today. Okay, Carly, over to you and you can take us through, through your amazing career journey. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for the, for the opportunity. It's really a a great privilege for me to to be invited to this and I really hope I can inspire some people to also just 
dig deep and go far because it's really been a privilege all my years I've worked. Uh, as we can, can start, uh, our company consists of basically at this stage of myself and my husband, Kubis Havenga. He's also a traffic engineer. So we actually uh, uh, a team. Uh, we are both registered prof professional engineers with civil engineering degrees and postgraduate graduate qualifications. I hold a master's degree in, in transportation engineering and here honors. Uh, I think I, I need to start off by just sort of giving a general indication because not everybody knows what a traffic engineer or transportation specialist does. Uh, our, our main projects or uh, the most common project is traffic impact studies that's required for new developments and if there's changes in land use that is normally required and that uh, is our core business. But then we also do a site traffic assessments, access investigations, parking relaxation studies, access management, traffic in input into road design projects, road, um, uh, my, um, uh, road master plans, swift, uh, swift path analysis where you, you put vehicle tracks on, on plans and see if it can work. We do signal design. We do access, access control studies. We do conceptual designs of intersections and interchanges and sections of roads. We do filling station applications. We do feasibility studies. We do section seven reports. We do, do traffic and transport input into precinct plans. So that is just sort of in short what our work entails. Uh, uh, you can easily say when you see a road, a traffic engineer was involved. Our work work involves the conceptualization of traffic and transport oriented projects. We are involved in new plan developments before anybody else knows about a project. We work, our work is not, not only financially rewarding, but it's also very satisfactory to see the plans you've made actually being constructed and working. Uh, the bulk of our work is in Gauteng, but we are also working throughout the country. We have done a, a substantial number of projects in Polokwane, and a few in, 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 in projects in other provinces, Limpopo, KwaZulu-Natal, Mapubalanga, Eastern, Western and Northern Cape and Northwest. We've also done work in Zambia, Swaziland, Botswana. Uh, uh, the slides that they can put up now will give you an indication of some of the projects we were involved in. Uh, then the last few slides will just give you an indication of the location of the Gauteng projects that we did over the past six years, just to give you indication of the of what we've done. So we can just go through here. Here's a, a, a social Google crossing major, a big uh, shopping center. And then this is called the Cook Sister Crossing in Polokwane. It was quite a challenge to sort that out. And it's uh, we've, that was actually our first major project and it's still uh, successful today. Uh, if you can go to the other, this is, I think this one is Monument Road that they've already implemented. It's nice to see if you design something and, yeah, and, it, and it works. You can scroll down. This is just an example of, this is a typically a, lay, a layout the town planning will send us. And then for that, we do a traffic impact study. Uh, this is filling stations and uh, along uh, major roads that we did. You can scroll up. Uh, thank you, you can go on. Yeah, yeah, there's another one. And then we will typically, um, we will get, uh, we'll get a, a layout as indicated here on the left. And then we will typically do the traffic impact. And then we will we'll basically put together a road uh, that can carry uh, the, the development. And we will produce plans like these. Uh, at a, it's, it's still a conceptual level, but it's, it's good enough for the civil engineers just to carry on, on and do the detailed design. We will determine how many, many lanes are required, these traffic signals, what kind of traffic control measures are required. So this is typically what we do. You can carry on. Yeah, this is a, a master plan, a roads master plan we did for Midrand, for uh, uh, Johannesburg Roads Agency. We did this, uh, where we determine all the, because Midrand was, for instance, was uh, basically small holdings that over time developed into 
bigger developments and we, we had to put together a road ma master plan that will be able to carry uh, the densification and the new develop development. So this, is, this was quite a, a huge job we did over a period of time, but it's still on, everybody is using it, uh, you know, that, that does uh, traffic impact studies in the area. So it guides their work. So this is one of the major projects we, we've done and we're still working on that. Uh, yeah, and then this is where I actually stay. Uh, this is Serengeti Estate, and this is we've been the traffic engineers from from uh, from the initial start, and we're still doing traffic uh, work for the for the developer David Nagel. So yeah, you can carry on. Uh, yeah, this is that last slide. Just just shows the the uh, the number of projects we've done in the past six years, just in Gauteng. It's just a slight indication of the, the amount of work we, we, we're doing <laughs> yearly. Um, yeah, so, so we can, uh, I can carry on and just start uh, on my career path, basically Corley Haven got transportation engineers, our career path. Uh, born and raised in the middle of the free state, I only learned about a career in such as a civil engineer in my grade eight year. When my parents sent me for a career test, I tested high for civil engineering. I was fortunate to be invited by a distant family member in the middle of my grade 12 year to spend two year, uh, weeks at Grinnaker. Grinnaker is a construction company in Johannesburg. Amongst other exposures, I spent two days at the construction of the then called Ellis Park Stadium. After two, those two weeks, I decided to follow this path. And I was actually fortunate because this distant family member of mine really encouraged me and it, uh, it really opened the door for me. Now, I must say the day that my parents dropped me off at the University of Pretoria was my first visit to Pretoria. I was raised on a farm and I was re not really familiar with, with urban areas. I found studying civil engineering very challenging, challenging, especially because I was, we were only two female students in my first year in civil engineering. And prior to us, uh, there, there was uh, five years not with any female. So they didn't really know how to handle us. Uh, and amongst the first year students, we were only 10 female uh, students. Uh, at that stage, there were about like 500 civil engineering first year students. So only 10 of us were women. So you can imagine, I think, I think change, things have already changed a lot. I, I, have, I was the only female staying in a boarding house in the hospital that studied engineering. In those, day, those days, you won't even be able to imagine that. There was no cell phones or anything like that. And there was no laptops, la laptops uh, and no male students were in, allowed into the female hostels. And the hostel doors closed at 10. And we had to study much longer than that. So I felt very isolated at times, I must say. Getting assistance from fellow classmates were very challenging. It was difficult. Fortunately, I met my husband in my first year. And we were uh, able to assist each other. Uh, and we studied, we, we utilized the uh, university library a lot to study. We, we got married whilst I was still a student in was in his final year, year. He was able to work to support us. The subject he still needed to complete to get his degree. I was taken and we were able to share notes. Uh, so he didn't need to attend classes. It was not as if like today you get all the notes and the stuff you don't. In those days, if you don't attend the class, you didn't know what was going on. Uh, at that stage, he still needed to do his two year military service. Fortunately, he got uh, an opportunity at his employers, uh, that was VKE at that stage, and then they now, now SMEC, to work on a big site uh, just outside of Pretoria. But he still had to do his military training, and for him to get extension of time, he needed to study. So for, he wanted to, to take the opportunity to, to work on that site because it was a very exciting job for him. So he actually then enrolled and do a in that is honest degrees in transportation engineering, which he did over two years uh, to get extension of time for basically the army. After graduating, I started at KBK engineers and did geometric road design. 
uh, this was my first exposure to PCs, and that was in 1995. Before that, we just worked on mainframes. There was nothing like a PC. You can't, I don't think you guys will even imagine those times. Can't even imagine it. Okay, the company had a sufficient work the first year I worked there. And I was really uh, lucky, and I worked directly under the director responsible for road design. And I, I got very good assistance and support. But after about uh, six months or more, a few months, I was fully capable of, of doing a whole project on my own. So the second year there at KBK, the company has had less work. So I found myself idle at times, and I, I thought I'm not learning as much as I should and of what I'm capable of. So I started looking at other opportunities and at other options. Uh, I basically started looking for another job because I realized, you know, I'm not really going to uh, progress or, or too much there. So there was an opportunity at Scott and the Vol. They were called, called Scott, the, Scott and the Vol those years. They later became SSI and the company is now Royal Husqvarna and H, DHV engineers. So they gave me opportunity and uh, it was one of the big companies in South Africa. The opportunity was in transportation planning. And one of the requirements was that I to, they wanted me to do a master's engineering degree in transportation planning. Now, I really at university thought, you know, after studying civil engineering that I really not gonna do anything else further, but this opportunity presented itself and uh, I, I just went to it. But, I must say at university, transportation planning wasn't my favorite subject. It was actually my least favorite subject. I was ne I never in my wildest dreams if have I ever thought I'll end up as a transportation engineer. But I took the opportunity because the opportunity pre presented itself. Uh, completing my master's degree took, I think, three years. I had to attend classes in the morning in Johannesburg and work in the afternoon and study at night and over weekends. At that stage, I felt pregnant with my first child and I had to dig deep to cover all that was required of me. I, you know, being an engineer, a student, a mother, a wife, it was quite challenging. I worked for eight years for SSI and, a and, had, and had a lot of exposure to very big and challenging projects. SSI was part of the PWV consortium responsible for the development of an overall transportation network for the PWV area. It's now basically Gauteng province. As a young engineer, I was fortunate to work with very experienced engineers on large and complex projects. At that stage, I was the only transportation engineer, except for the director of transport planning in the Pretoria office. Uh, in those years, that was the early 1990s, the whole, and a whole new trend to do public participation became a requirement from the authorities. I was selected or nominated to be the project leader of, to drive a public participation process for a public transport initiative, basically for the PWB consortium. I was only selected because nobody else wanted to do the job. And I said, well, bring it on. I'll try my best. Uh, this opened the door to certain weekly meetings with the top engineers of six, com six companies, five civil engineering companies and one town planning company, uh, where strategies were brainstormed. I was also involved in the technical engineering work for that project. This opened an opportunity work to work in the public transport industry for various authorities. At that stage, we worked, we, we've done work for national, provincial, regional, and local government. Uh, this was particularly challenging. I studied civil engineering because basically I was, I wanted to work with numbers and not really with people. And I had to do presentations in English and being raised in the free state, there was no English speaking. So speaking English wasn't easy for me. Uh, I remember at one meet, uh, we had a, a huge meeting at this uh, city hall of Janus in front of a lot of engineers. I almost had an anxiety uh, attack, you know, I was so anxious. But I pulled through. Uh, I was also uh, put in charge of big public transport initi uh, initiative to formalize the taxi industry. 
I had to attend weekly meetings with the taxi industry, basically with taxi associations. At that stage, uh, the taxi industry was, was, uh, was actually quite violent and I was threatened uh, a few times. But, uh, but I was actually grateful for the experience because that really exposed one of my weak points and that was to work with people. And, uh, and it really forced me to de develop as a person and not, not only as an engineer. In the early 90s, forward planning was done by the different authorities. And there was opportunities to, opportunities to identify problem areas in the, and then write uh, proposals to basically address it. And, and, and I, I actually started excelling at these and I, I were able to land quite a few projects for the company. But then for change to happen, you also need frustrations. So I can tell you about a few of those. All the years I worked for consulting engineers, we had to fill in timesheets at the end of the week, allowing, uh, allocating our time to different jobs and projects. I didn't really like that much. And I found myself also frustrated with directors and colleagues booking time on my projects and not really adding more value in my opinion. Uh, and then there was also a lot of small things that started bothering me. For instance, I found it difficult to be 100% true to my own value system within the company system. It was hard to book all my time to projects and not being able to afford the time to serve or help somebody because you must book your time to, to projects. The, the company also required more hours per day for me to be promoted. And I wasn't really prepared to give more than eight hours a day. I had two children at that stage. For this, I was actually being penalized because I didn't book over time. I really worked, I tried to work hard and complete all my projects in time, but I didn't work overtime. But the company system really, they calculated the overtime and we were uh, given bonuses on that. And so that started bothering me a bit. And uh, then a big thing that bothered me, and I still pick it up, you know, along the lines, even on radio stations, that Monday was a dreadful day. I wasn't looking forward to Monday. And Friday was the best day of the week. And I said, this can't be. I can't wish my life away. So, you know, Steve, there was some friction. There was frustrations. Uh, most of the things bothering me, I did manage to address at the time. I realized not to take things too personal, rather address it in an objective manner. This was thanks to a colleague who gave me good advice. Advice, He said, you are in control of your own life. If you feel things are negative around you, you must make a choice. You cannot afford to stay negative. You must either change the things that, that are in your power to change or accept it and just and stop being negative or remove yourself if there's an opportunity. I decided that my current situation was still best and I put all my energy into my work. The last year I, I worked at the company, I not only got a huge salary increase at the end of the year, they also offered me the opportunity to be associate. At that stage, it was very unusual in South Africa for women engineer to be to, 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 to be a, a promoted to associate. Uh, women engineers weren't really recognized in the early 1990s. A new start. So before accepting the offer, I realized this will require a lot of more, more time of me, which I was not really prepared because I was a mom and a family was very important to me. Within a month of this promotion, I felt I should resign and start my own business. I can't really take full credit for that because it, this was really a divine intervention. I started calling Havenga Transportation Engineers in the early 90, in, uh, early in February 1996, and I started working from home. I decided to work under my own name because I was already known in the industry. The first project I did was for SSI, my former employee. I was uh, appointed 
to complete an uh, extensive project. I, I managed the land for them just two months before I resigned. I was very blessed to have a consistent flow of work from the moment I started. At the end of my first year, my husband also resigned. He initially had a lot of plans, more construction orientated. All his effort to do his things came to nothing for reasons totally out of his control. So he started assisting me with my work and the flow of work just started to increase. Our skills complemented each other. My training and work experience were more transportation planning, whilst his were more geometric design, construction and traffic engineering. Initially, we got projects from mostly regional and local authorities in transportation planning. I did a substantial number, amount of work for the public transport sector. The fact that I was a woman gave me a slight advantage in the late 1990s. From 1996 to 2006, we did civil engineering transportation related design and implementation projects. This included intersection upgrades, road upgrades, public transport facilities and pedestrian facilities. During this period, the company grew to about five employees. Changes in the industry like procurement policies, way leave and occupational health and safety requirements made us reconsider the design and implementation part of our work. Uh, transportation traffic engineers were, were, in demand, were in demand, and we realized that there is an opportunity with our experience and qualification to specialize and not to, to, to do any detailed design and implementation projects. Basically, conceptualizing projects and then leaving the detailed design to the civil engineers. We made a decision to focus on the transportation and traffic engineering aspects. We placed a high value on family and wanted to be able to spend as much time with our children and family. We choose to stay small and rather uh, do more specialized work. We co collaborate and work in joint ventures and in consortiums with various other professionals, providing the traffic and transportation input into, uh, in projects. This opened the door for us to work on major projects in the country and abroad. We worked and are still working with our fellow consultants. We do not regard people doing the same work than us as opposition. We see them rather as colleagues. Now, if I can just share a few of our principles that really helped us carry on working. Uh, we do not regard work as hard labor, rather a privilege to do something to help others and the country move forward. Identify your own weak points and manage it. It's very key for us. We do not work because we are forced, we rather work because we want to. It's an attitude change. We embrace every day of the week and we do what we can and we do it as best as we can. We do not despise small projects. We found a lot of times small projects well executed lead to more and bigger projects. We do not run after the big clients. We try to serve all our clients equally and as best as we can. We try to support and assist our colleagues whenever there's an opportunity for it. We try to be as fair as possible when, we come, when it comes to prioritizing projects. For, this, for some periods, this was challenging because there was times that we were totally covered with work and we had to say no to people. And then people will say, but they will pay us double if we prioritize their projects. But then we say, we can't do it because that means we're deprioritizing other uh, clients. We keep... Uh, our own values, we keep to our own value system and we do not allow our work to rule our life. Basically time management. But you also need to stay in a system, be disciplined, start work as a set time and end at a set time. Do your best every day, never postpone things. Just start, even if you are not 100% sure how you, you'll do a project, just get started. 
and then make work pleasurable for yourself. We often engage in far off projects we, and then we just combine it with a small vacation and make the most of it. And uh, we don't take shortcuts. We never lower our standards. And then be hands on with every project. We will not only use technology, for instance, Google Earth, we insist on visiting each site. And then another of our principles, we're not working on risk. Many companies do the conceptual part of a project on risk to try and land the project. We only do the conceptual part and has never done work on risk. We believe a worker is worth his wage. This also ensured that we stayed impartial. We serve our clients, but we also serve the general public and the authorities and trying to come up with solutions which is best for all and will, will, will stand uh, the test of time. Now that was basically our principles. Then I want to share this with you. I once employed a Tyler who, who were quite a, a inspiring person to me. He did some tiling at our, our, our home. And uh, not only was he um, always joyful and proud of his work, he said the following after I asked him if he has other work lined up after my, my project. He looked at me and said, no, I don't have, but I'm not concerned because I believe if one does a good work, work will be looking for you and you will not need to look for work. I found that quite inspiring. Now there's business challenges. There's a lot of business challenges all the time. The three biggest challenges for us is still cash flow management. And that is, if you get money in, you shouldn't regard it as a salary. You must be very conservative with your money and build reserves. Another one is getting paid. Not all people are honest. Not all people pay you. So sometimes you don't get paid for work. And then our biggest challenge is actually getting approval from authorities on studies submitted. Yeah, then in conclusion, I'm, we're very grateful for our industry, which gave us and is still giving us a good life. We also believe we will still be able to keep on working for a long time. One of the advantages of our work is that we are able to continue working beyond the set retirement age. We're also in a position to set our own pace with work. I hope my story will encourage a few of you to step up and move forward to become a specialist in your field. I believe there is a bright future for individual, individuals specializing and becoming very good in a specialized field. And that is basically in short my story. <laughs> wow, Carly, that was such an excellent presentation. I think your story has definitely inspired many on the call. I certainly am very inspired. I made many notes <laughs> and I hope that we can have a chat so that I can really absorb more from you. You have such a wealth of experience, knowledge, and just wisdom that I think you've, you've shared on this call today. There's so much that you've said that's definitely gonna stick with me. For instance, just start. Sometimes you do feel overwhelmed with a big task and, and you, you just gotta start. And I guess it'll come to you as, as you go along. Um, I think also your story speaks a lot about just taking charge of your career and taking charge of your future. And I can see you've done that from an early age when you realized that the initial company that you were working for wasn't going to take you to where you wanted to be. And then moving to a royal husband and getting the experience that you wanted there and then moving again. And also you spoke about the, the public participation program where no one else wanted to do it. And you put your hand up. And I think as young engineers, that's what we must do. We must put our hand up when there's an opportunity at work, when um, others don't want to. If, we, if it's going to get us to where we want to be, put your hand up, just start. There's experts out there that are willing to help you. There's so much of knowledge, especially in, with platforms such as CESA. There's really, there's really no excuses to take charge of your future and to really control, have control of, of your life. I think you spoke a lot about your 
I would say you evolving as a person um, and focusing on aspects that maybe you were not so strong at, such as public speaking. Uh, for once, <laughs> yeah, and I know what you're saying because when I used to uh, first host these events, I also felt like I was about to, you know, have a panic attack. And I think with practice, um, you get better at it. If you watch maybe one of the first uh, meetings that I hosted, not not very good, but uh, yeah, with practice, I'm I'm starting to get better. And I think young engineers should also put themselves out there, join platforms such as the CISA, SAE, SAIC, et cetera, where you have an opportunity and a platform to speak. And you can build confidence on the softer skills uh, rather than just engineering skills. And I think those skills do assist you when you want to start your own consulting business, when you need to talk to clients. So if you're not getting that experience in your firm, definitely there's lots of alternative ways to, to practice in, in that regard. Um, so we have a few questions on the chat um, currently for you. I'll start with Lebo Kang, and she basically wants to know about how you um, went through your journey of becoming an XR registered engineer. How long did you take firstly? And then did your masters help you? And uh, for those on the call, Corley was one of the first um, young female EXA registered uh, women. So she definitely assist assisted us in breaking through the glass ceiling uh, of engineering as young women. As she mentioned, she was one of uh, one of 10 out of 500 students uh, that were female. So definitely, Carly, thank you for setting the path for young engineers like myself or young female engineers. So yeah, let us know about your EXA registration journey and, and how you went along with that. What were some of the challenges you faced and some of the big lessons that you've learned there? Yeah, that was quite challenging because at that stage you had to do practical work, construction work. And I didn't really see, I was, I grew up on a farm and we as women on the farm didn't really mix with the males. It was just, there was, and I didn't really see myself running on a construction yard. So that was a difficult obstacle for me to, to overcome because I didn't particularly like that. So uh, the, the master's degree actually opened the door. I managed to, to, uh, to become a professional engineer without basically practical experience because of the specialized field I went into. So I think it took me longer than, uh, I think the minimum period I can't even remember was like three years. It took me about, uh, yeah, basically after I graduated with my master's, I was able to to, uh, to, to be become a professional engineer and uh, uh, meet all the requirements. Uh, but also I must say, I was like, I maybe it wasn't that clear in the vision, but I was, I, I really worked on very exciting projects and I, I was given responsibility at the firms, even at the first firm and the second firm at, at a young age. So I was based, that actually helped me with my registration a lot to have, uh, to, to, to be response to be, be responsible and take because I was doing my own uh, projects from a very early stage so that really helped me but I can't actually remember how long I think it took about six years or I took six years but because initially there wasn't a great incentive for me because I didn't really need to be a professional engineer but later on I just also pushed because you've got to do what you've got to do because if you don't do the first things, the next thing will not open up. So even if you work in a company and you think, or you work at a, a council and you think, ah, it's not necessary for me to become a professional, to be registered because they don't require, if you don't do that, the next door won't open. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Very insightful. So. Um, as uh, Curly was mentioning, you have to basically do it to open the doors for yourself, especially now. And yeah, so Curly, from what I understand, you basically put yourself out there, you've taken on the role of some exciting and big projects and that experience and the responsibility of managing the, those projects assisted you in your journey of becoming an XR registered engineer. So to the uh, young engineers out there, Something that you can take from Corley's book is really to diversify what you know and get involved in multiple projects, big projects. If you see something uh, big happening in the company, make sure that you put your foot forward and uh, get some experience there because that's going to help you with your career development and also with your Excel registration. 
Okay, currently another question that we have, this one is from Godfrey. <laughs> um, so as a traffic engineer, um, your job cannot be easy with the, with the state of the public road infrastructure in South Africa. You know, we have multiple potholes that we enjoy every morning. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a game to get around them. And then uh, if a car breaks down on the freeway, I mean, that can back up traffic for hundreds of people because of maybe uh, poor planning that happened uh, way in the past before your time. You did speak a lot about um, master planning that you've done. And um, as young engineers, we will come into projects where we're doing I do electrical master planning, others might be doing civil master planning, etc. And I think um, the, the work that we do now really has a large impact and a great impact in the years to come. So when we're doing certain projects such as master planning or even just uh, infrastructure project now, there's definitely um, things that we need to consider for the future um, uh, future citizens that are going to be using that road infrastructure. So that being said, what's the state of South African uh, infrastructure? I know this webinar is on youth best practices, but what do you think are some of the bad practices that have been uh, seen over time that got the roads to the state that it is now? And how do you think as young engineers or this, there's lots of civil engineers, road engineers on this call, what do you think they can uh, do in their design work to make the traffic system, I mean, better for those in the future. Yeah, that, uh, that's a difficult one because the, 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 the master plannings are actually, it, there's a lot of master planning that's been done a long time and they're excellent, but it's a lack of implementation. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the, uh, the different spheres of government have not actually taken the forward planning that was done and implemented. So it's basically a lack of implementation. It's not a lack of planning. There's a lot of planning, but it's, it's basically on the implementation side. And that goes back to money and government spending. So I'd rather not say more than that, but it's not a lack of planning. But as a young engineer, I think we mustn't give up hope and we must just all do our best. And, try and convince politicians to spend money on, on forward planning and to, imp, to, to, to allocate money to, to, to infrastructure development. And, and, and if we all just try and do our best there, because a lot of times I think people don't actually put, put forward uh, budgets for things and, and then it just don't happen and it just don't happen. And that, and that is what happened over the past year past years and you know that there's just no people don't realize the importance of infrastructure for your country to develop but it's not a lack of planning it's a lack lack of of putting getting the money there and I think we as engineers must really develop ourselves more because we we are not counselors we're not there and those people don't get guided to, to actually realize the importance of spending money on roads because there's always something that's more important. So, but I think we as engineers must, must just really push <laughs> and do our best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, Corley. I think that speaks to professionalizing the state. Um, young engineers are here on the call. Instead of always running away from government institutes, maybe that's where we must be. And, and that's the change that we need to make. Um, in the state. So um, currently another question for you um, to start your own business. Of course, there's lots of uh, leadership and management skills that you have to have. I think you just mentioned um, cost management or cash flow management. Um, there's lots of young engineers on the call that um, may not uh, have their own consulting firm, but cash flow management is, a pro is an issue. We don't really uh, focus too much on those other skills besides technical. So um, what advice do you have in, in terms of management skills that young engineers um, should develop that would assist them in their career going forward? I can tell you what I did. For the first year I've worked, because we were two engineers, me and my husband, I saved my whole salary for 12 months, I didn't spend a cent. And I can just tell you, don't look at your salary, just take what you need. 
and be as conservative as possible and build up reserves because it will pull you through through times that's difficult. And we, we went through times that's difficult. At the stage, for a period of eight months, we didn't have work because of political things that happened. Uh, but without reserves, things will happen to you. And I've, I've, there was chance, I had a brain tumor, for instance, six years ago, and I was out of work for, for a period of time. And, and so I just, just be conservative. Don't, just forget it, don't focus on money and don't, don't live too high too soon. Keep your living standard as low as possible, as long as possible and build up reserves because you're gonna need it. <laughs> wow, that's, that's excellent advice. So don't look at your, your salary and what you can do with it, but rather build a reserve and exercise physical discipline. Yeah, so we, many of us need to, need to work on that. Um, I think uh, many can take advice from that. We definitely do need to exercise physical discipline in our career. And I think as Carly was saying, if you're looking to open your own business, your salary or your cash flow, your income from your invoices, it's not your salary. You do need to build up a reserve for the future. That's that's great advice, Carly. Um, and then also you mentioned your work-life balance and work-life integration. And that, that really resonated with me because I read an article recently on what people on their, just say in, in their dying beds, what did they look at and what would they have wanted to change in their life? And most people did not mention, oh, I wish I did that report a bit better or took on another project or went into this field. And it was all to do with spending time with more time with their family and their friends and those around them. So I do admire that you made those changes in your career so that you were able to integrate your family and achieve um, that work-life balance. Um, I think you also mentioned in, con in consulting engineering, we're very time-based, but you had that discipline to use your eight hours a day. And I think if you're productive for eight hours, there shouldn't be much else that's re required of you. Um, eight hours a day is a lot of hours to be productive and then to still integrate your family into that. And young engineers on this call, I think can take, a, take away a lot from that. From Yes, you have to push hard when you're younger, but probably use those eight hours productively and still make time for that, which will be important to you um, as you go on. So can you just e expand a little bit on that? Yeah, I must say, the, I'm so fortunate and I'm so grateful because I've got two, two boys, they're both married, I've got two grandchildren, I've never missed a single sport game of any of them, but that's actually fuel, fuels you to work harder uh, because you work for something, but because just working for money is nothing, What money is nothing, but you need money, but why do you need money? You need money to enjoy life, how can you enjoy life if you, you just one 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 track minded even now i make time i i play tennis twice a week i've got set appointments uh because it keeps me fit and i enjoy it and there's a social interaction because i my husband goes out to meetings a lot i don't actually particularly like going to meetings so i stay home and not home and at our office our offices are at our offices are all at home but then uh you, you must decide what's important and set time for that because that makes you even more productive because there's something to look, look forward to. And, and I think it's important to enjoy your work as well. I can truly honestly say I like a Monday. I don't mind a Monday. I don't mind. I love writing reports. I, I love my work. I'll keep on working till I'm 80 if I can, but not as much. I'd like to work less and afford more time to, to go to the children and visit them. But but I think a happy life is a productive uh, a career. It's a, I think to balance things to, for me is, most, is the most important thing because work is not all, but you need work. But if you can balance it, the work is nice because just holding, being on holiday, how long do you want to lie on the beach? I mean, you'll get bored. You, we must change our thinking. Because I really love my work. I'd love to keep on working. Uh, but because I don't 
I didn't overextend myself. I think that is when we start hating our work because you're tired all the time. You, uh, you just, and you become less productive. We're very productive and I only work, I, we start half past seven every day. And I've tried to, to stop at, at five. I sometimes go over just when there's a lot of invoices or admin, that, that's the only time I'll work overtime. And I, I mean, if you, if you look at our jobs, we're very productive and we don't work overtime. <laughs> so it's achievable. Yeah, definitely it's achievable. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I think I like how you say you don't uh, dread a Monday. And a lot of us, when we first start working, we dread a Monday. I think Friday is, is the most exciting, Saturday, you start thinking about Sunday and on Sunday, you know, you're not looking forward to Monday. And I've also been working on uh, rethinking and reshaping how I view Mondays. I mean, there's many Mondays in a year. There's many Tuesdays in a year. We can't choose the days in which we want to be happy and excited. We have to try and make the best of it. And I think you've shaped your career and um, your path such that you enjoy what you do. And I think young engineers, we must enjoy what we do. And as Cordley was mentioning about her, her early life, she made those hard decisions. She had those uncomfortable conversations with a friend who told her, look, you can't just sit there and be negative, take action. And, and yeah, we, we have to do that. We have to have those difficult conversations with ourselves sometimes so that we can reshape how we look at work. And I think when, we're, when we have work-life balance and when we're happy about what we do, we will produce better work, better work in shorter time. Yes, so th thank you for that. Um, Carly, there's a question for you from Senzo. He says, do you think that new, that the new or next generation of engineers should actively participate in politics um, if we want to reclaim the professional, the professionalism in the state um, in regards of citizens? So what do you think there? Should we be active politicians? I think there's a huge opportunity for that because I think that's, that's been a lack and that I think is we're partly the engineers, the old generation is partly to blame for, for that because engineers don't like to, to speak in public. We just need, want to do the work and get the work done. So we need people to put up their hands and, 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 and be a force there and help people so that the right choices can be made. I think there's a huge opportunity for engineers. Okay, thank you. I think it also that also answered Wesley's question, who um, wanted to know about our involvement um, in the state. Um, so, Carly, you also spoke spoke about when you were working at KVK and the pipeline wasn't looking good, and you decided you decided to move. You didn't uh, sit there and let's say pass time and and think of a way to fill your time sheet every week, etc. So that is, of course, a very difficult uh, decision to make. Um, when you want, when you feel like your current opportunity is not extending you to a point where you're learning enough and growing enough, um, what advice do you have in young engineer to young engineers that may be feeling the same? Is it sometimes valuable to wait it out until your pipeline gets better, or do you? Or when is the time to jump ship? Let me say. Uh, there's no direct uh, advice I, I can give you. I think most engineers is intelligent enough. For me, you know, you, 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 you've, you've got to see where you are and where is the opportunities around you. Sometimes you don't have an opportunity and then you do the, your best. But for me, as a young person to sit doing nothing, it's terrible. But I must say, change, uh, times have changed. At that stage, remember, we didn't have internet. We, there was no, you had, what, what was basically bothering me, I had to sit at work doing absolutely nothing. But I didn't have an internet. I didn't have any way of actually learning more stuff. I had to sit there. I couldn't go to my children who was taking care of and doing nothing. That frustrated me tremendously. I think things have changed a lot. So you don't have that clear cut thing that I had because now you don't have an excuse. Sitting at work, you can still work through courses. You, there's a lot of things you can do at your work. If they don't have work for you, you can do some. I had basically to sit doing nothing and I refused to do that. Uh, but I think things change now. So I, yeah, so yeah, I think you've, you've, you will know 
But I think jumping ship is, is not always the best thing because I think nowadays people jump ship, ship too quick uh, because sometimes it's good to stick it out. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I, it's difficult for me to give advice. I think everybody needs to evaluate their own thing and see if there's still opportunity. But there's sometimes opportunity at the least expected place. It's like this public participation thing really opened my, uh, 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 but there was an opportunity, but it was something I basically hated. And even traffic engineering was something I didn't like. I wanted to become a structural engineer. I liked uh, the, the numbers and stuff, but sometimes you just need wisdom. <laughs> you need wisdom. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Sometimes you do need wisdom and oh, lucky for us, we, we get to, to get some wisdom from you today. Um, so th definitely we will apply these lessons in our lives. I remember the first um, youth best practice webinar that I attended that CISA hosted in 2019. Um, it was very strange times then because we sat in a room without any masks. The room was full. Um, we shook hands. <laughs> yeah, mm. but th those lessons that I learned from the seasoned engineers then, and I feel the same about what I'm learning today, it really does stick with you. So if you don't have wisdom, you can always attain it um, through listening to those that have experience and have gained experience. But has, as you were saying, nowadays we do have opportunities to learn uh, when, we, when we're not learning. So don't stop learning is, is basically what you were saying. Look for an opportunity um, to learn. And those opportunities always exist. Sometimes, as you just mentioned, it's not what you had seen for yourself or what you had initially planned for yourself, but it is what will assist you in your career and really um, grow your grow your fundamental knowledge of everything, not just what you want to just specialize in. Um, so um, thank you for that. Are there any other questions from the panel? Okay, I don't I don't think there's any other questions. Currently, are there any other uh, remarks, maybe something that you feel you've left out that you would like to share with us today. I think we've got a lot of little wisdom nuggets from you, and I hope uh, we can hold on to them for as long as possible. But yeah, any other aspects of your career or your or your life that you want, would want to share? No, I think I think I'm okay. <laughs> There's nothing that I can think of now. I've, yeah. Yeah, if this was an in-person event, I think we would definitely want to ask you as much questions, but I, I think I interrogated <laughs> your career enough. Um, if one last parting question I can ask you, I think in the beginning you mentioned that um, your the, the, the attitude that you need to have as, a, as an engineer and how you've managed to basically build that name for yourself and for your career. Um, as I was mentioning, when we think of traffic engineers at Biggin, we think of Carly. Um, so how did you manage to do that? And what advice do you have for young engineers that want to stand out amongst um, the engineers that are, I mean, as many engineers, as many ex-registered engineers. So how can we stand out as an engineer in today's times? I can't really take credit for that. I think you must just stick to your guns. I think you must just do your best every day. And remember your name is, is all you've got. And if you never sow negative seeds, you've got to sow positive seeds all the time. You've, you've got to be, just be positive and get, even in the mornings you don't feel well, just take yourself by your collar and say, I'm going to do my best today. I think it's not so difficult. It's a day by day, hour by hour thing. And just be positive and do your best. And then the rest will follow. That is what I've always believed. And, and, uh, and don't look, just look at every opportunity that presents itself to you and consider it. Don't just disregard and don't disregard small things. Small things can lead to bigger things. I just say, so just live life full out and do your best and, and motivate yourself every day to be positive and make a positive contribution. Then I think it will just happen. Mine just happened. I didn't um, really, when I was young, I didn't even think I will become a, 
uh, independent consulting engineer. It wasn't something that was really on the cards those days. There was no, there were no individuals, you know, doing that. But I just tried my best every day. And don't be overwhelmed with things because that was something I needed to, to fight. Because a lot of times they gave me these projects, then I didn't have a clue to do it. But you as a consulting engineer, you can't ask somebody else to do it. You, like I've said, you just start. And when you start and you start writing, you think of things and you and there's another thing that opens and you think, okay, but I must um, investigate this. And when you investigate that, something else opens. And uh, I think just just do your best and th th then your name will, will follow you. Uh, you. I've never tried to build my name. I've just, I've just been myself and, 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 and just do my best. <laughs> Wow, okay, so if you have the right attitude, a positive mindset, and you put in the work, the rest will, will follow. Yeah. And yeah, that's quite interesting, okay. And then we have one more question from Ecoli Kevin. And he says, uh, being a business owner, what are your thoughts around N6 engineers? And do you think companies look out for N6 engineers? So those that attended a, a TVET co college, basically. I, I don't really have a lot of knowledge on that. I, I think there's always room for anybody that does their well, work well. So even if it's in six or it's a graduate, I think if you can just produce, there will be work for you. Yeah, but I mean, I don't have extensive knowledge on that, but I believe there's, okay. there's room. Okay, so there's room, there's... Um no barrier to entry if you do good work basically okay um Carly I think that's all in terms of the questions and yeah we will be looking forward to having you again um there's lots of comments in the chat here um Star just said thank you Carly for inspiring words and definitely sharing your life and career experiences this is absolutely motivating um you literally just gave me hope and reawakened my enthusiasm for civil engineering. And that's just um, one of many, many comments. I think you have inspired many engineers here and we are quite uh, privileged to have, to have spoken to you today. Thank you so much. And um, please do join us again. Hopefully we can start having in-person um, youth best practice webinars like the one I attended in the past. That seems so obscure now when I think of it. Yeah, and we're looking forward to learning more from you. Thank you for sharing your experiences today on behalf of CISA and to the young engineers that are on this call. Please do attend other um, webinars and sessions like this that CISA hosts. We host this on a weekly, monthly basis. There's always activities, um, always online webinars and I think we need to really build our network. So if you manage to chat to someone on this call, do keep up those relations. Um, as Crowley was saying in your career, as a consulting engineer, you cannot say, no, I'm not familiar with this. I'll skip it. <laughs> There's lots of uh, work that you'd have to do some research and development. And when you have a big network, that makes it a lot easier because you can uh, gain info from, from those in your network. And that's also what I found quite useful in my career. Um, it's attending the CISA events, taking a few numbers down, remembering that this person is an electrical engineer at, at another company. And I think you spoke about that. Your people in other consulting engineering companies are not your competition. Um, they're your colleagues. You're working towards the same goals. And I think we are, really have an opportunity to learn from others. So. Thank you for that, Carly. Thank you for all your wisdom nuggets, as I've mentioned. Um, it really means a lot to all of us. And thank you to those that attended. Okay, have a good day going forward. <laughs>